divine pattern of the universe. It's the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai, and he showed him this threefold tabernacle pattern in a vision. Later on, Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The tabernacle pattern is a threefold pattern consisting of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and it operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The school has 10 primary constitutional objectives and aims, and they are as follows. One, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Five, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And 10, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. We'll begin this afternoon with a prayer by Dr. Sean Hudgen Wardle from our Ontario class. And we'll have a scripture read, which will be Matthew, the 18th chapter, and that'll be read by Dr. Jerry Geller from our Oceanside class. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Let us bow our hearts, bow in our hearts and in our minds um, for a moment of prayer. And that doesn't mean to put your head down and close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father Yahweh, we pray that what is spoken from the floor today offers up a greater and more profound understanding of your divine purpose, pattern, and plan that you willed to will in the day that you created the universe that we abide in. We pray that you bring us back to a revelation or give us that revelation that we need to know who you are and how you actually exist. We pray that you keep us through all of the distractions, the trials, the tribulations, and all of the different things that will keep us away from learning about your purpose and your will. All these things and more in the name of your only begotten son, Yahshua the Messiah. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah.
Good evening, class. Tonight I'll be reading Matthew, the 18th chapter from the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trena of the Scripture Research Association, Incorporated, Matthew, the 18th chapter. <clears throat> At the same time came the disciples unto Yahshua, saying, who shall be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Yahshua called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offense. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than to have two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. If thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into the fire of Gehenna. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is, came, is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them have gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the assembly. But if he neglect to hear the assembly, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a transgressor. Verily I say unto you that whatsoever ye bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Then came Peter to him and said, Rabbi, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? And Yahshua saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. For as much as he had not to pay, his master commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and entreated him saying, sire, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which showed him a hundred pence and laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me that which thou owest. 
And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went to cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their master all that was done. Then his master, after that he called him and said unto them, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou have had compassion on, the, on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise, my heavenly father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother, their trespasses. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Thank you, Dr. Jerry Geller and Dr. Sean Hudson-Wargill. And we'll have a, our scripture readers this afternoon will be Dr. Linda Volpe from our Oceanside class and Dr. Sharon Welch from our Syracuse class. We'll have a three speaker format this afternoon, each speaker getting approximately 30 to 35 minutes. And our first speaker this afternoon will be Dr. Frank DeMassey from our Syracuse class. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Glad to be here. Uh, this scripture, brings a lot of things to my to my mind. Let's start right at the beginning. I'll see what I can do with it. Matthew 18, 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Yahshua saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Yeah, Linda, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you, but I'm not trying to be rude. <laughs> Just uh, things pop into my head. You know, uh, again, now, this is the apostles talking to Yahshua, and, and they're asking him, well, in heaven, see, they're, they're, they still, uh, they don't have a complete understanding. They're thinking carnally. They're saying, well, who's the greatest in heaven? See, they're, they're so enthralled in, in their human existence that they think, well, there's, there's a big I and there's a little you. And that's not how this works. You know, we're not talking about uh, the big eyes or little use. What we're talking about here is a nature, a nature of, of, of that soul that's been converted compared to a soul that's not. And uh, all of us, before we came into this class, each of us had a nature. Each of us had our own theories, our own concepts, and our own opinions on how we thought we should be reverent to our creator. Uh, we all had, a, me, I had a world according to Damasi. And uh, I thought I was a good guy. I didn't st steal, I didn't kill, I didn't hurt anybody. So I thought I was good. But in reality, I was dead as a doornail because I had no spiritual understanding of my creator. And that's how each and every one of us came in before the mercy and grace was bestowed upon us and our eyes were open to this gospel. That's how we all were. We were a carnal. We were, had a carnal mind. We had all we, we had to uh, perceive is everything that we saw with our physical eyes. Nothing else made any uh, spiritual sense to us. We, we thought basically in my life, I just took what the, what the priest told us and went from there. But by mercy and grace, our natures are changed. The way we see things, the way we feel, the way we uh, understand. I didn't even know, you know, for 30 some odd years of my life, I was kneeling down and doing the sign of the cross and saying the Our Father in confessions whenever I went and never understood, well, Our Father who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Never even knew, never came to my recognition that my creator had a name. And that's, you know, Romans 1, 19 and 20 becomes so essential to our understanding 
of Yahweh's purpose. I didn't know he, he even had a purpose. All I knew was there a sky God and there were things I had to do and everything I had to do, I always failed at. And instead of blaming the church, I blamed myself. So I was always in, I was in bondage and didn't know it. I was in, always in condemnation, always feeling guilty and I couldn't conquer it. I would be on my knees and praying and opening my heart and saying, well, come on in. That's not how it works. He chooses us. We don't choose him. Okay, keep going. And Yahshua called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now, now people that are reading this, in their minds, they're, they're thinking that uh, they're looking at pictures when they're in the third grade and thinking, well, there's a little kid, and only little kids can go to heaven. They're, they're not understanding that they're not, he's not talking physically, he's talking about a nature, he's talking about innocence, he's talking about how he's going to change us, not how we're going to act. He's doing all these things. Yahshua is is the only one that can reveal himself to us. We don't have the power or, or the intelligence. If, if we did to fix ourselves, we wouldn't need a savior. Read on, please. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Exactly, you're talking about a nature. That's the nature of Yahshua the Messiah. There's no pride. No. In this kingdom, in this world, all there is is pride. All there is is division. All there is is chaos. There's no pride. There's no division. There's no chaos in the body of Yahshua and the Messiah or in the nature of Yahshua and the Messiah. He says he is, he is peace. He is righteousness. He is joy. Just types and shadows of, of the nature that he's putting in us. But we didn't know any of that before coming to this class and sitting down and listening to this gospel. We have to realize how blessed we are, that we have ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart that's now being changed. Can I have that uh, the names chart? Yeah, but look, raise it up a little bit so I can show the hand. On, on the top. Yeah, now I see there, you look at, at, at this chart on the left, on my left, it's actually, it would be the right, but on the left, it, it has the true names of Yahweh, the title Elohim, and Yahshua the Messiah. On the right, it's like a veil. You have the red, purple, and scarlet veil. And there's now, you see a hand that's pulling back. It's like a, a curtain that's being pulled back. Now that hand, that's not a physical person's hand. That's not Dr. Kinley's hand. That's not Dennis Volpe's hand. That's not any physical man's hand. That's Yahshua in principle, taking the flesh out of your, out of your eyes and revealing spiritual principles to you, understanding that number one, Romans 1, 19 and 20, physical things will reveal spiritual principles. Spiritual, physical things. So you can't meet anybody and not have an intimate relationship with them and not know their real name. It's that simple. A name is very essential in knowing anything about your creator. But you didn't do that. That's not your hand. That's not anyone else's hand that you said, well, you know, wow, he, he, he pulled that back and made me understand. No, no, he didn't. It was Yahshua. It was all in his purpose. It was set up. At a certain time in your life, your eyes are going to be open. Your ears are going to be able to hear. I used to love what Dr. Kennedy would say, you heard me, you're not blind. But what does he mean by that? Because you're not only hearing with your ears, you're understanding and seeing with your mind and your heart. You're, you're seeing the principle. It's, it's integrated in your soul, in your very essence, in, in your personality, how you act, how you react. All these things are changed, and it's only by Yahshua that that occurs. 
All right, can we go on, please? Five, and whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones who believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. See, that's what the scripture is talking about, how important and how essential Yahweh, understanding and knowing Yahweh is. Only There's only one way unto salvation, that's through Yahshua the Messiah. There's only one way unto, unto eternal life, and that's through Yahshua the Messiah. There's no other way. You either you're in the body or you're out of the body. You, you, there's no warm. You can't be hot today and cold tomorrow. That's not how it's going to work. I'll read on. I want to get down to like the, the eyes and all that stuff. Um, seven. Woe unto the world because of offense. For it must needs be that offense has come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, sorry. I'm sorry, Lynn. You know, we don't realize, I'm trying not to be so dramatic, but this is life and death. In reality, there's no greater love that the man has than lay his life down for his fellow man. We're not talking about your physical life. Your physical life is temporal. Yeah, that's, that's showing bravery, but that's your temporal, that's your physical life. What we're laying down is our eternal life. We, we don't, we got to have, we can't have a finite mentality when you're dealing with an infinite situation. This is infinite. This is an eternity. There's no beginning. There's no end. There's no time in that state. And we're laying down our, our, our spiritual lives, hoping that one, somewhere, somehow, in Yahweh's purpose, because souls are, are being saved, that's what, that's what we're in the business for, is converting souls, is saving souls, is allowing people, or, or allowing this gospel to be preached, so somewhere, somewhere, somehow down the line, someone's going to hear it, and a light bulb is going to go off, and all of a sudden, a love is going to be sparked, and an interest, and in in they're they're going to be hungry and they're going to want to learn and they're going to all of a sudden things become physical things become less important and spiritual things become more important and then to a come to a point in the understanding where your spiritual understanding is everything it says in the book what does the gain of man if he inherits the whole world and he loses his soul so all of a sudden when you start to see and again, that, that that veil is being pulled back, and all the things, because all them things, Lord God and Jesus, these are all um, misunderstandings and mis misinterpretations. But it's, there's more to it than that. It's all the beliefs. It's all your your concepts and all the things that you did before. All them things are going to be changed and thrown away. You can't go back to those things once you see and understand what Yahweh, what Yahshua opens up to you. There's no way you can go back to that. You can't go and, and uh, think you, if you go to church every week or three times a week that that you're 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 working on your righteousness. Or or now you can if you go to class three times a week, you're working on your righteousness. That's not the motivation. The motivation is because you want to share and you want to you want to uh, experience the love of this gospel and the beauty of this gospel. That's something you want to do. It's not something you've got to do, and you're not doing it for any selfish or any self-motivation. Uh, Your motivation is for others. Your motivation is for the love of the truth. Your motivation is for the love of a, a name where you realize that you've been separated from the world. You've got all these people praising Allah, praising uh, Jesus, pra praising Jehovah, all the different, you know, are praising themselves, are praising some sports or some car or some uh, way of life. All those things that were all precious and what you wanted to pursue, those things become way less important to a point now where, where you know, you realize they are what they are. You see the value of them, but you, you see way more value of, of your spiritual 
understanding and your spiritual knowledge of Yahweh's purpose. I'll read on, please. Eight. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. The people don't want to hear this and they think that we're extremists, but we're not talking about cutting your hand out or, or fucking your eyes out. We're not talking about that physically. We're, we're trying to make you see the importance of it spiritually, the principle, the principle, the severity of, of a carnal nature compared to the nature of Yahshua the Messiah. You can't have, there's no iniquity, there's no chaos, there's no division in the body of Yahshua the Messiah, in the nature. There's none of that in there. It's all been, it's, uh, you've been converted, you've been sealed. And, and then you start, to, the moment you start to realize, once, you, once he starts a good work in you, he's bound by his word. There's no lie in him. He's got to finish it. He'll never put you in a situation you can't handle. But you're going to have faith. And your faith, is he's going to bring it to your, your remembrance. You're going to go back to the book. You're going to go, that's why the law and the prophets are so essential. Because you, they're points of reference. You can go back and see those principles and how it always, it's just his purpose overturns and overturns. And all the time, it's righteousness, peace, and joy. It's, it's death, burial, resurrection, change. All these principles are all set up for us to see. That's the foundation. That's our faith. And that's how we're saved is by our faith because of the witnesses. But we couldn't see them on our own. He has to open up. There, there's that hand again. It's not no physical man's hand. That's Yahshua taking the flesh out of your eyes and your heart and making you see and understand. Uh, read on. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more over that sheep than over the ninety and nine, which went not astray. You know, these are all spiritual principles that he's using analogies to, to try and, and make people understand the importance and the essential and, um, value of, of a soul. I mean... There's nothing more valuable, and it's not even ours. Like it's the mo most valuable thing we have. Everything is Yahweh's. We're all they all came from Him. We're all going back to Him. And so, but the point what we're trying to emphasize is the importance of a soul. I how what how Yahshua feels about you. He is. He's not the source of love he is love he's not the source of mercy he is mercy he is those things it's the essence of them things he's knowledge he's not the source of it he is it and all these things he allows us to to understand and see and now once you once you have that understanding your very nature changes your very way of thinking changes and you become a new creature. And that's how this, this gospel works. It's by the foolishness of preaching that all of a sudden that, I, that light bulb lights up and all of a sudden a spark happens. And wow, my creator did have a name. Because when I first came to class, Jesus was, was a big thing and Mary was a big thing for me. Uh, you know, when you're a Roman Catholic, they, they really stress Mary more so in my church, they did. And, you know, those things, 
it changed it, it changed the way you were reverent to your creator, how you thought your relationship with your creator. Because you didn't know. I didn't know there was no J. To this day, in the Greek, Latin, or Hebrew language, I didn't know that. But I didn't know the importance of it. I didn't know why he died on the cross. I didn't know. But what greater love? He conquered death, hell, and the grave for us. Because now after Pentecost, our personal Pentecost, he can't, that mystery of iniquity can't get to us. We're sealed. Does that mean he's not going to torment us? Oh, yeah, we're going to get tormented physically, but not spiritually. He can't come in and, and change our, our ways. If we're, if we're sealed, we're sealed. All right, read on, please. 14. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. See, again, we're just talking about nature, uh, a nature of a person. If they're going to be stiff-necked and argumentative, and prideful they're not in the body of yashua they're not they're not a brother they're they're just they're just carnal minds and our only hope for those carnal minds is that somehow in some way through yahweh's purpose that that they be converted and that nature is taken out of them i'm going to get to uh a, a 20. Uh, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I remember Dr. Kinley saying that right in, in this class, he said that he's raising up both mysteries in this class. He says he's not kicking about it because he's telling us that there's doctrines out there that they are going to be uh, presented that aren't the doctrine or, or the gospel that he taught us. But he said, he wanted us to be to know about it so that we don't accept it. And we have to realize how blessed and how how fortunate we are. You know, uh, I was a big lottery player. You know, I loved to play the lottery and never want to think, you know, and always was so uh, consumed and, and always hoping. Yeah, I, I acknowledge. Well, I, mean, I always acknowledge that. Uh, I, I I wanted, like I, I was denied something, and I would I would become bitter, saying, "Well, geez, other people win, why can't I win?" Then the realization came that there's no greater lottery. You can you can pull a lottery of five billion or whatever kind of billion dollars you want. Sooner or later, that money is going to be spent, or you can't take it with you. This gospel, this gospel converts your soul. It converts your nature. It, it changes you and it, it's, it's with you forever. Once you know something, it's yours forever. And you share it with someone, it doesn't take away from what you have. And that's the fruit of the spirit. That's how Yahshua is. That's, there's no, everything about him is fruitful. Everything about him is righteousness. Everything about him is comfort. And that's what this gospel is. It's, it's about comfort. It's about realizing and understanding that you have a, creator that is, is complete control of his purpose and all we can do is sit back hold fast and know that sooner or later we're so close to in a blink of an eye we're going from one age to the next and all the fleshly things all our miseries all our ailings are going to be left behind and we're going to be going home and we're going to be in peace no more agony, no more tears, no more worries, no more miseries. And all this is by grace and mercy. And we've been called and we've been chosen to be, to be converted to his nature. And it's just the greatest. There's no, what greater lottery is that? I can't, I can't even imagine one greater than that. So uh, I'm out of time. I just hope I did the best I could with this. I, I hope I inspired someone.
I'm going to give all honor and all glory to Yahshua, and I'm going to give up. Thank you, Dr. Damasi. And our next speaker this afternoon will be Dr. Marcos Cobo from our Gates, New York class. Hi, good evening, or good afternoon. Good evening. First, I'd, I'd like to make sure because Honestly, this is my first time on a Zoom class. So I'd like to make sure my audio is okay. You guys hear okay? Yep, you're good. Okay, thank you. Um, and like I was saying, this is the first time. So bear with me, it's definitely different. And uh, it might take a little getting used to. I like what the previous speaker got into, uh, Frank. And I'm just going to keep going with the things that, that he brought up. Uh, I also was brought up in the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, I went to junior high school at the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Oh. That was the name of the school. And as, uh, as Frank was saying, a lot was put on Mary, a lot was put on the Pope, and all, and all these things, and, and we didn't know. I mean, here I am, sixth, seventh, and eighth grader, and I had no clue about anything, and sucked it all up, believed everything they said without asking any questions about it. And later on in life you you just realize where you were and go wow that was that was something that was something now one of the things that they taught us is that we could pray to mary and she would make intercession for us or she was the uh, intercessor one of them there was others mm -hmm. um Olivia, why don't you jump over First Timothy, I think the second chapter. One of the first few, maybe fifth verse. Oh. Uh, um, let's start at one. First Timothy two and one. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honestly, honesty. Is that what you wanted, Michael? Well, I think I want you to get to five, ultimately. That's fine, but five okay. is where I want to go. Okay, for three, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of Yahweh, Yahshua, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one Yahweh <clears throat> and one mediator between Yahweh and men, the man, Yahshua, the Messiah. Now, see, they never brought that up in, in junior high school. In, in church, in Roman Catholicism. I've never heard that before. And for the most part, they never encouraged us to even read the Bible. And even went on to claim that the things that we read there, especially in Genesis, were fireside, campfire fables. And I'm, I'm quoting a priest that my wife and I went and studied under for, a, I think it was only one or two times, because we wanted to learn something about where we were. And this is when we had first come into class. Someone in our family said, well, you know, you ought to know what, you ought to try to learn what your own religion is about or what Catholicism is about. I go, oh, okay. And then we, for a little bit, compared 
what were being taught in classes and what were being taught in Roman Catholicism. And I know some of us have experienced this. We've gone to the eye doctors and you're sitting in the chair and he's got the lenses in front of you. I'm nearsighted, so I, I went through this quite a few times. And he'd put those lenses in front of you and he'd say, okay, well, which one's better? Is this one better or is this one? And it was this one or this one. And you know pretty quick if you're looking at one and you see it pretty fuzzy and then the next one, the next one comes in nice and clear, you go, oh yeah, that, that one's better. This one's better. Nope, the other one was better. And it's quick and it's easy. And that seems to be how it felt when I first came into class. It was so quick and easy to see the difference between what's in the book, what thus saith Yahweh, and what thus saith somebody else. I'd like to go over, I'd like to, go over to Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith Yahweh. For as, the heaven, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, I've, got, I've gotten into this a couple of times now at, at our library class. And he says, this is Yahweh. And he says that my thoughts are not like your thoughts and neither are my ways like your ways. And in fact, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts as the heavens are higher than the earth. Now, we can't measure that. We can't measure that. That's immeasurable how high the heavens are higher than the earth. It's, it's infinitely higher. And they'll never get to the end of the universe with whatever ships they're sending out there or satellites and get to the point where they go, oh, that, that's as far as we can go. We can't go any more, any further. It'll just keep going and going. So when I came into an understanding of that, or when that was shown to me, among other things, that proved that Yahweh is real, that puts the rest of us so in, in, infinitely small compared to him that we just, we just gotta, gotta put all of ourselves in the same lifeboat and hope that Yahweh can save us. Because none of us can do it. We can't study up on it. Mm -hmm. We can't, we, we can't, none of that stuff um, that people feel that they're so smart about and that they can figure things out about our creator or even make the claim that doesn't even exist because they've studied geology and rocks and evolution and this and that and the other thing. And my goodness, his thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts that we're not in the same league, ladies and gentlemen. We're not in the same category. You can't, it's not like Yahweh gets the 100, and then we're down below. We get maybe get a 55 or a 60 or an F or anything like that. No, we're not even, we're not even measured. It's immeasurable how much higher our creator is than us. And I, rem I remember being in class very, very uh, short, short time right at that point. And somebody came to me and says, oh, I got I to gotta tell you about this guy he, uh, that I, I met. He's, he's got, he studied here, he studied there. He, he went to all these places, this, that, and the other thing. And he proceeds to say, and, and he's got God all figured out. He figured it out. And I was new in class, but when I heard that statement, I said, hold, hold on, stop. I said, stop, stop right there. Now, I may not have shown a lot of wisdom when I said it, but I said it. I said, I already know he's wrong. 
I said, I already know he's wrong. No one's going to figure Yahweh out, or at that time, God. No one's going to figure God out. That's just not going to happen. Okay. You have the creator. You have the creator of the universe, who's got all these things in line, in order, okay. perfectly fitting together, and you're going to tell me that some some man or whoever figured it out. I just know that's wrong. Now, I said, now, if you'd have come to me and said, this man claimed to have had a a vision or that God talked to him, well, now you got my attention. Now you got my attention. And I'll consider what you're about to say. Now, before coming down to class, I wouldn't have thought that way. It was just the opposite. When I first heard what this teaching is about and where it came from and through through who it came from, that some man claimed to have had a vision and a revelation straight from the creator. I Initially, I went, oh, uh oh, and I balked. I went, something's, I've never heard that before. And when I did hear it, it didn't end up very well. I grew up in the days of Jim Jones and some other weird stuff, and I I heard about them, and so I thought, ooh, this doesn't, right? But then he went on to say one thing that separated them. He said that this man said, and you make me prove it. Make me prove it till you're satisfied. And that was different. And then the relationship began, and that's that's how I started uh coming down to the classes little by little. And I wasn't boom. It wasn't a wow for me at first. It was a slow, slow process. But I do recall the first time that someone broke down the body tabernacle, which I had never heard, of course, and made those correlations between the tabernacle and the body. And that changed for me right there. That was the moment when I realized this Bible is for real. Mm -hmm. This this Bible actually is real. And I didn't think that way before. I thought, come on, the Bible, that, that thing's so old, they, they can't even get yesterday's news right in the newspaper. And you're going to tell me that this is right? And that was my thinking. That was my thought. Yet Yahweh has preserved this so that we could understand and learn about him. And that's that's an amazing thing. That that puts us all down there where we just got to give thanks. Thanks to our creator that he's showing us anything that we can learn about him little at a time and that he's real. Now, in the in the scripture reading, mm -hmm. they asked him that that first first verse, I think it was. His disciples came unto him. Yeah, unto Yahshua, saying, "Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven?" Now, why why is it that people ask? You know, they what were they thinking? Now, I know sometimes we read mm -hmm. these things and go, "That you know, they were probably." Uh, all of this is for our learning, but some of the things that they would ask the, 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 ask the Messiah, you go, who cares right now? You go, who cares about that? I'm just glad I'm, if, if you're in, you're glad. And why do we care about who's the greatest? And again, that's what man, this is a man's thought. That's a man asking him. His disciples, none of them had the Holy Spirit at this point. And they were as wrong as wrong could be with some of the things they were thinking. And we, we, we do that around now. We, we, we put ourselves and we give ourselves awards and we give ourselves prizes and medals and commendations and degrees over things that are of this world. And... When you come to realize that Yahweh, when I came to realize that Yahweh is real, 
I mean, to the to the core. Everything else that I considered of value, or it's like my whole my whole world changed. My whole world changed. It just wasn't the same anymore. And it took the power of Yahweh to make that change, because I thought I was headed on a on my own course. I'm going to do my own thing, whatever. And we all had that thought before coming down to these classes. We all had our course somewhat planned. We knew we wanted to do this, want to do that, study here, study there, become a whatever. You fill in the blanks. And then Yahweh steps in and takes over. And by the way, hallelujah for that. Mm -hmm. Um. Yet that's the way man is. We we go in here and we we we, have, we put our thoughts into it. We we just put our thoughts into it. Now, if you keep reading, one of the other things that because um, I came in a little late for the scripture reading, um, okay. talking about becoming as little children. Now we're all children. We when we all came into this class. We were just simply children. And in the eyes of Yahweh, that is. And we're we're all in the same in that same lifeboat. There are no big eyes and little U's. We all need a savior. I'm just flipping through here. And there was a part that I, I keyed in on here about the word despise. <clears throat> and I'm looking for it real quick. Mm -hmm. It's on the 10th verse. Mm -hmm. 10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven... Their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. Take heed that you not despise. We, we, I recall listening to a, I wish I knew the gentleman's name. He's in class. He was in class, or I think he still is, from Alabama. And there was a testimony he gave, which I listened to. And he said that, and he knew Dr. Kinley. And he said that he must have been having some issues with certain people. But he said that Dr. Kinley told him, and I'm going to paraphrase, not to despise anyone. Not to despise anyone. And when he said those words, I knew it affected him because you can I can see it was a it was a lie it was an interview it was a video interview not just an audio interview video and he was emotional about it at that point not to despise anyone and I took that to heart even though I listened to that I think it was over a year ago or more not to despise anyone and I've parked there the term I like to use sometimes. I parked there and thought about these things, about not despising anyone. And, you know, you think to yourself, well, that's hard to do because, I, boy, I hate so-and-so, and I hate this or I hate that. And, and you look at that and you think that's just the same meaning and all this. But we're all, again, we're all in the same boat. Don't despise someone who may not understand what you're saying or may not agree with you on certain things, especially if it comes to these uh, things of the world. I regret having some conversations with conversations with some people over things that I saw. Oh, they're really, they're really uh, involved in this. And it was a, it could have been a political opinion. It could have been a, uh, an opinion of who's better, the Boston 
Red Sox or the New York Yankees or I mean some people are very fanatical about things and I saw that this didn't go in a good direction having a conversation about some political opinion and I said oh, oh well, let me let me back um, we got to back off because I I don't want I don't want to be in a, in a situation where the brethren and I have a have a a difference of opinion on something like that, which doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Our political affiliations does not matter. It really doesn't. None of this stuff really matters that's going on in this world. Yet it will tear people apart in this class even. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I got into that. I apologize. Um, I'd like to continue on with the uh, with what we're here for. I don't know who's on this right now. Like I said, this is my first time on this Zoom. I know there are some live. I know there. This is being recorded, I believe, because I see I see the posts on YouTube. So I don't know who's ever going to listen to this. And I just want to say a couple little things of the importance of where this came from. And this did not come because somebody thought it out, researched it out, or anything like that. The teachings that, that, that we're exposed to, the charts that we're exposed to on these uh, Zoom channels, all came by divine vision and revelation. And it didn't come from the man, Henry C. Kenley. It came through the man, Henry C. Kimley, but he gave all the credit to the creator, to Yahweh himself. These are not the result of a man's divine divinity, degree, anything like that. This is, this is something from the most holy place, if I could put it that way. This is Yahweh, this is real. And this is the truth about it. And loving the truth is something that I believe is unique in the people that attend these classes, that believe the report that he, that that man gave Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley. I believe his report. I believe that he did have a vision and a revelation from Yahweh himself. And I'm grateful that Yahweh has given me to love that, to love that little bit of truth. And there's another scripture reading we, we got not that long ago. I think it's over in Second Thessalonians, second chapter. Let me go there. I want to get down to <clears throat> those that believe the truth. Uh, yeah. Uh, not love of the truth, but believe the truth. Um, I, think I, I think I want to get to the 10th verse. Okay, Second Thessalonians two ten. Yeah. And with all, you, oh, you sorry. may have to you may have to pick it up because if you jump right there, it's going to look sound a little little strange. Okay. Verse seven. Okay. Would you like seven? Yes, that sounds for good. The, verse seven. Okay, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hindereth will continue to hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom Yahshua shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy it with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, 
and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And that's what I was after right there. They receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now, there's somebody that's going to be receiving the love of the truth, and there's some that are going to not be receiving the love of the truth. And I hope and pray that I am one of those that received the love of the truth. And I see that. I mean, I, I'm a, I witness that because that's all I want to hear about these days. What is the truth about the matter? And I don't mean, and, and not only in what's out in the world, because we're getting bombarded with information that you know, we, we don't know what's true anymore. I can't believe anything anymore. I don't know what to believe when it comes to, oh, take your pick, economics, business, all, all these, all these uh, venues out there. And for the most part, it's hard to tell who's, who's telling us the truth. So spiritually, we got the same, we got the same fight going on. And well, because the mystery of iniquity does work and he's still working, he's not making it easy for us. And there's, there's going to be a case where, well, and they're going to try to a little twist, a little turn and turns the truth into a lie. But the, but we're here so that we can learn of the truth. Now, Dr. Kinley had that vision and revelation. And like I was saying, I believe that report. The things he brought out, never heard before. And he took the book and he proved it, that it was real. And one of those was, you don't have to pray to Mary. Mary is not your intercessor. And that because there's only one intercessor. And he got to the book and he, and he pulled it out. And there's so many things he brought out that way that were brought out in classes by, by, by people that were taught by him and people that were taught by them that were taught by them. And on and on. And we're hoping that that baton is still being passed. And not a different baton, the same baton. There are too many uh, witnesses out there still that heard what the founder taught. And we have transcripts and we have video, um, we have tapes. We also have videotapes, 1958 video, in which he himself is describing the one, two, three pattern of salvation and the breakdown of all the, the chart I'm looking at right now that we're looking at right now. Where there's a one, two, and a three. And he points to the down there at the, uh, the, mig the migratory pattern with that one being down in Egypt, see? And then two in the wilderness and then three in Canaan's land. And he just took each one of those, one, two, three, one, two, three. And it was so simple, it was so beautiful. And the names, it was so simple, it was so beautiful, coming in his father's name. And then, and how the name of Yahshua isn't, we're not playing a, a name swap here. Well, oh, you guys are just you calling them Yahshua, we call him Jesus and you know, it's all the same. We go, no, no, I'm sorry, that's not even close, no. This is not a name swap. Yahshua is not Jesus. And when we came into an understanding of that, the difference that Yahweh is real and that he's not a Trinity, that was a big one. That was a big one for me, Trinity. I've been here in Trinity all my life. And then they pointed out that, well, the word Trinity is not even in the Bible. And I, Come on, really? No, but they were. It was might have been in the missile in the missile 
or the mislet or the misled that they used to hand out in, in church. I don't know. I haven't been to one in a long, long time. That's just my my choice. I'm not telling anybody else to avoid that. Sometimes it's good. And and uh, and go back and listen to these things. And you can see where you were and appreciate and give thanks that you're not there anymore. Now, receiving the love of the truth that they might be saved. Read the next verse, please. And for this cause, Yahshua shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That's that they pretty, might... uh, that's, 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 that's tough right there. Yeah, if Yahweh sends you a delusion, oh my goodness, you're going to, you're going to think, no, it's, this is the truth. This is the, this is real. This is the way it is. And that's a strong delusion that you think that, and Hey, the, the only way we, you come out of that delusion is, is divine help. And that's if Yahshua gets you out of there. That is the only way. And I've had more pity lately and, and felt bad for some people that I, I try to tell and try to go over these things and, and tell them the truth about our creator. That he's got a name that it's important, by the way, that his name isn't Lord. It isn't my Lord. It may sound like you're you're doing it, but it's oh, but it sounds more honorary, honorary or respectful. And and I go, yeah, but and in in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, but those are your thoughts, and not his thoughts. And 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 how many you, you try to explain to him that Yahweh is real, and he was not pleased with people with Israel calling him my Lord or Adonai. And we got that also recently where in Hosea, second chapter, they didn't translate those words, did they? Ishai, Belai. There's a reason they didn't translate those. Can we go over there? I think it's Hosea the second and mm -hmm. five or six. Mm -hmm. Two. Should be 16. That's yes, that's right. Yes. 16. yes, 16. And it shall be at that day, saith Yahweh Elohim, that. Thou shalt call me Ishai, and shall call me no more Belai. Now, of course, in my book, as well as all, Ishai is translated as my husband. Right. And Belai translates into my Lord. Now you know why they didn't translate that. Uh, ten minutes, five minutes, got it. And... And my Lord, as people were, you know, we, 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 we're we hearing that all the time. Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, my Lord, praise the Lord, and over and over again. And, you know, it doesn't take too many generations to continue using my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, and never use the name of Yahweh, where we're back to Jeremiah, 23rd chapter, where he says he wasn't pleased with those prophets, priests that changed his name or, or caused his people to forget his name. See, that's a way of forgetting his name is by continuously using my Lord. Well, it's more respectful. Well, no, he wasn't, he wasn't, that's your thoughts. He wasn't pleased with, with that. He wasn't pleased that Israel's, their, their forefathers had forgotten his name for my Lord. See, it's the, it's the same, it's the same scenario. It's the same scenario. Um, like I said, this is very, very different for me 
to be in a, in a Zoom meeting. I feel like I should be standing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, 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 I'm able to look at the book at the same time, at the same time you are. Um, and I realize that you can't, there's just too many things to cover to try to convince somebody that listening to these classes or attending classes, if you can attend uh, one, it is, it is important, as Frank was saying. It is vitally important. It, re it really is. And I am very humbled that I was able to meet people that told me about this teaching. And I don't hold them in high regard. I don't put them in a ped on a pedestal or anything like that. I do tip my hat and acknowledge that, well, no, I, you know, they're the ones who told me about it. And they're the ones that Yahweh used to relay the message. And just because they did that, they didn't deserve any special accolades or any special, any specialness because of that. See? That's all any of us should do and do do, is that we we share this gospel, and uh, and be grateful that we even believe it, that we believe this truth, and we love it. So I saw the uh, the note. I'm not sure where. I'm not keeping. I don't have a clock here. I don't know when that came up. Other than it was it said I had five minutes. Uh, the three hour difference, I, I wasn't sure. I, I, I would have came in a little earlier and got the feel from the beginning, if there is such a thing. Um, but I appreciate that you guys are, are setting this up on a, on a regular basis and making it possible for people who, for whatever reason, can't go to a, go to a class to uh, to listen to these things and uh, listen to these classes, listen to these testimonies. I, I think they are important, and uh, I'd like to thank you guys for doing it. I've I've listened to several of them on on YouTube, and uh, it's very beneficial for me. So, uh, all praises go unto Yahshua the Messiah, and I'll turn it back to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kobo. And our third speaker this afternoon will be Dr. Scott Miller from our Syracuse class. <laughs> Hello, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I was off the hook. Yeah. Well, I very much enjoyed the comments of the previous speakers. Um, I guess we can Maybe pick it back up in the scripture. Starting like at the beginning? Start. Yeah, why not? All right. I don't know how far I'll get. There's a lot in this, so we'll cut it up. Not going to cover 35 verses, but there's some stuff in here that we can go back over and work with. Matthew 18.1. At the same time came the disciples unto Yahshua, saying, Who is the greatest? in the kingdom of heaven. And Yahshua called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, that's a, we can stop there for a minute. So that's a very, that's an interesting statement to make that, you know, he called a child, you know, because I'm sure uh, when they're looking for someone to fight Goliath, they weren't thinking David um, to go up in the battle. But Yahweh had something else in mind. And he's always looking, like um, one of the speakers said, that his thoughts aren't our thoughts and his ways aren't our ways. And he said, except he called the little child and set him in the midst. And he said, except you be converted and become his little children. And that's something, again, we can't convert ourselves. 
and that's an interesting word. Um, can we have that looked up, possibly, if someone has that? Yeah, I'm getting a dictionary. If someone else has it, they can get it too. What is it? Converted. Got it. Have, I have it in Strong's if you want it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, from 4762 to twist, turn quite around or reverse, convert, turn back again. Right. So that's a good to turn because it's like if we keep going on doing the things we were doing, like or that old covenant, that's not changing anything. That's not learning anything. See, but when Yasra says you have to be converted or there's a change that has to take place. Yeah. I have to change from one form or use to another. Right. That's another good example of being converted. Um, in many instances back in the scriptures, um, there are types and shadows when things like when the children of Israel, you know, they were liberated out of Egypt. And we always say that, you know, after they went through the Red Sea, after Pharaoh was nipping at their heels and they thought they're going to die. And they went through that, like that death. They were in fear of death. They went through that burial through the Red Sea. And they were resurrected up on that other side that they didn't have the same mindset or they didn't have the same uh, nature in a sense. You know, they were still carnal it's before Pentecost. You know, and of course they went shortly thereafter went and built the golden calf, but but they went through a change, even if it was temporary. Um, when uh, the holy men, I think of Bezalel and Uri, her maybe, you know, they were given temporarily the Holy Spirit to change or to be able to make the tabernacle and to and to do these things. You know, they wouldn't otherwise be able to do it. But it's, you think it's like, well, you know, a lot of people when they came into class probably, oh, I don't, I don't need to change. Because if you, you know, if you don't think there's anything wrong with you, then you don't think you need to change from anything. So, and again, we can't convert ourselves. And, and you might think, well, be converted from what? Or to turn around. One thing is from the old covenant. Again, that's something that we're not going to be practicing after Pentecost. That's a change in the opposite direction, like 180 degrees. So we're facing backwards and, and Yahweh had to come in, get within us and turn us around. So we're facing the right direction towards the end. Like if we we're looking at the dispensation chart, we're in the fourth age. We were all looking back towards the third age. We were practicing things in the third age, in the wrong age. We weren't acting our age. So he had to take us, turn us around and face us in the fourth age. So we're facing towards the end. We're, we're faith, facing the fifth kingdom age. We're facing towards the end and we know what's coming up. We have to know what's behind us. Um, and as uh, Marcos mentioned in Thessalonians, how the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Well, yeah, he, he's already working. He's already been in operation. And that's something I certainly didn't think I needed to be changed from. I mean, who thought that, you know, they had um, a demonic spirit or an angel that was cast down from heaven, from the war in heaven, dwelling within us that had, we had to be changed or converted from or have that cast out of us. Um, let's read that again in fast. Mm -hmm. Read what? Um, Second Thessalonians oh, okay. 2. 2 and 7. 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Until he be taken out of the way. Well, we can't take him out. We can't take him out of our own way. He, Yahshua, has to be within us. The Holy Spirit has to be within us to convert our souls. He, that he has to be taken out of the way. And, and the, he did show a prescribed, and we'll get to that, how the tabernacle works, how there's a cycle, how there's like a circuit, that type of thing. 
showing forth the, the operation of the mystery of righteousness because you're basically being converted. There's two mysteries in operation. And if you could get the two mysteries, that, that we were the bride coming into class, whether we realize it or not. See, we we're on the right side there in darkness. And we, and that's really what you have to be converted from. That has the mystery of iniquity has to be taken out of the way. Uh, keep reading. H. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom Yahweh shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Right. And he did that at Pentecost. See, the mystery of iniquity was revealed. There was a time when he, people did, weren't aware of him, that he was operating in secret, that he was hiding, you know, hiding within. A, we, you know, a lot of people don't believe in Satan or the mystery of iniquity. And then there's a lot of people who think they do and think they worship him, but they don't even know what they're worshiping. They're worshiping a false representation of, of Satan. They're not worshiping uh, the reality of it. See, the both, like I said, both Dr. Kinley made that clear that both mysteries had to be revealed. So in order to see one, in order to see light, you have to see the darkness. In order to see the darkness, you have to see the light. Mm -hmm. So see, and then that, that wicked shall be revealed, whom Yahshua shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the bread. And again, and he will destroy him. Because we, we know there's no salvation for the mystery of iniquity of the son of perdition. That he's um, bound in everlasting chains of darkness. Which I think that's in Second Peter 2 and 4. Um, but keep reading there in Second Thess. Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Right. And that's, you know, the rest of the world, you know, there's only a small amount and it talks in the scripture about the sheep, you know, and it's not anyone who's, you know, this, there's a, a finite amount that's to be saved and see a lot of the world they you know they're deceived and they're trapped in unrighteousness because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved go ahead 11 and for this cause yahweh shall send them strong delusion that they might believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Right. So it's, it's a, that's how important the truth is. You know, I think I mentioned this, the, the, uh, how the lies have become such a regular part of our everyday life and society that it's just, you know, it's, it's sickening really. And we like, as we, I mentioned before, we just had someone lie their way into Congress completely, you know, and it's just stunning how, it's, you know, they haven't been shamed into um, resigning because it's just being accepted that that's, well, that's just part of politics. Well, no, it shouldn't be. Uh, go ahead. Let's see. 13. 13, but we are bound to give thanks always to Yahweh for you, brethren, beloved of Yah Yahweh, because Yahshua had from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Right. So he had from the beginning chosen you to salvation. See, this is big. So if you have that mystery of iniquity revealed unto you, and then he's taken out of the way, that's, that's in essence what, what that conversion is. That's what has to be taken out of the way. That's what people don't believe in or don't see or don't think they need help from. Because if you don't think you need help, then you don't, <laughs> you don't know that you know, don't know that you don't know. But, you know, that's what has to be taken out of the way. And that we can't do. Um, let's go over to um, Psalms, the 19th chapter. 
Uh, start at one. Psalms 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of Yahweh, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Right. And we know from Romans 1, 19 and 20 that we could look at the physical things of the creation to understand spiritual things that are revealed. So we know that this creation is just screaming with, you know, the way Yahweh operates and the things that he made um, aren't just for our pleasure, but they're to show us something about how he operates and what is going on with his purpose. Whether it's the water cycle um, or the way the tabernacle is constructed or the operation of the priesthood and what that shows. Go ahead. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Right. So their line, it's like line upon line. That's how we teach line. Of, and there's lines of demarcation throughout the whole earth. There's latitude. There's longitude. There's um, like the Tropic of Cancer. There's different lines set up for a purpose. So everything's delineated, separated. And so we could see a purpose of the way Yahweh operates. We have different poles. We have winter. We have summer. We have light. We have dark. All these things are Romans 1, 19 and 20 things that show us things about the purpose of Yahweh and both mysteries. Um, and go ahead. Go ahead. Which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth like a strong man to run a race. Right. So it's like a bridegroom. He's like our husband. And it says in them, he had set a tabernacle for the sun. So if we know that our tabernacle and see there's the sun over the head of the bride there in that tabernacle and the moon on the other over the mystery, because, you know, that's showing that the old covenants governing the bride and that's what we were under who wasn't following was anyone following the new covenant i mean that's what you don't need to be converted if if you're already doing the right thing which none of us were we didn't know any better see and then um that's why it says the moon under her feet and it shows an eclipse under there that's like with yashua coming in after pentecost and eclipsing that old covenant way of worship and bringing in, in a spiritual covenant that's not physical. See, it's, it's like a tabernacle. He set in them, he set a tabernacle for the sun, but it's S U N, but it also, we you know, means the S O N, and that's Yahshua in our tabernacles. He's, he's like a bridegroom. Go ahead, read five again. Which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth like a strong man to run a race his Go keep going mm -hmm. his going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it and there is nothing hidden from the heat thereof right his going forth is from the end of heaven and a circus it's like a circuit like an electric circuit how it comes down and in um if you're just looking at the operation of the priest, there was a daily ministry in the tabernacle, the high priest, there was sacrificing of animals, there was a cleansing, there was a, an anointing. And then the priest went into the next, into the holy place, there was a daily lighting of candles, there was a, um, inter, incense or intercession, there was a daily eating, there's things that happen daily. But once a year on the day of atonement, the high priest put on garments of beauty and glory and went into the most holy place and then went around the tabernacle facing it, sprinkling blood and having incense with its censer, creating a cloud. And then you had the revelation or the flash of the Shekinah for atonement. And then he came around like swiveling, like our heads on a swivel or it's witnessed by like the arterial circle of Willis. It's in our brains. And it comes around and comes back down and it's like a circuit. And it's like our circulatory system is sort of like where the way the blood operates goes up and down and all through our body. It's like a circuit. So it's talking about from a physical standpoint, these operations, these systems in our body and 
Yahshua and the priesthood operating in us. Now, if that's happening, the mystery of iniquity is not operating in us. See, and that's part of when one's, when the Holy Spirit's in you and these things have been revealed to you, then you're sealed in these things after Pentecost. Again, that's important after Pentecost. And that's part of that, what we're going to go ahead and read seven. The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The, the testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. Right. So that law, and it's, it's, not, it's not the Mosaic law that's converting your soul. See, that couldn't do anything for you. That was just a type and a shadow. So we know we got to go back. That's why we go to the law and the prophets. Um, it's to point these things out. So. And there's that conversion or that change that has to take place going from one thing to another. See, but way back here, it's saying, go ahead, read that again. The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. Right. So that law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. See, the old covenant wasn't perfect. It couldn't make men perfect. See, and it says that in Hebrews, but let's... Um, Oh, where do I want to go? Um, uh, I guess. Um, let's go over to Isaiah. Just let's hit that first. Because that's another example. Isaiah 55. Mm -hmm. that's like another example of like the circuit type where Yahweh's op his purpose is operating it was also uh, picked up by one of your previous speakers touched on this too you want to pick uh, it up start uh, start at one okay Isaiah 55 and 1 oh everyone that thirst is cometh ye to the waters and he that hath no money Come ye, buy, and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Right, that's Parkin a good question. Where do you go where you, buy, where you spend money for food and labor for that which satisfies not? Mm -hmm. but it's not talking about physical bread and physical water, read. Hearken diligently unto me, <clears throat> and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Yeah, let your soul delight yourself in fatness. It's talking about the soul or the inner man. That's right. what has to be converted, or that, that mystery of iniquity has to be converted out of you, changed or booted out of you, then your soul undergoes a change. And again, it's nothing you're doing on your own. See, and it's about eating spiritual food and letting your soul live. It's just like it's delighting itself in fatness or goodness. Free. Incline your ear and come on to me here and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Right. Incline your ear. See, Yahweh had... He has to give you an ear to hear, though. You're not, you're not hearing this on your own. Here in your soul, see, it's about your inner man living. Not about your physical body living, but here in it's, it's about the soul. And he says you will make an everlasting. That's that new covenant. It's a permanent. The old covenant was temporary. But the new covenant is everlasting. Read. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commandment to the people behold um, thou shalt skip, skip down to eight eight for my thoughts are not your thoughts neither are your ways my ways saith yahweh for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts for as the rain cometh down and snow from heaven and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. 
it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Right, so like that water cycle, or that hydrological cycle, as the rain cometh down from the snow, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but it has a purpose. It's the water, it's water the earth, and to make it bring forth in buts. It's, it's, it's going to be fruitful. It's going to have an effect. It's going to have a change. It's like um, you ever see a desert's dry, and, and then it, when a desert gets rain, and I'm sure that happened in California <laughs> with all your rain, that some of these desert areas probably sprang to life like, an, an, like a, an immediate resurrection. That what, mm -hmm. once what looked dead for months and months on end, all of a sudden would spring forth for life and have that change or that conversion. And that's showing forth like Yahshua or the mystery, the casting out that mystery of iniquity. And show, cause that's a dr dramatic change. And once that happens and you're sealed in this gospel, see, he can't get back in there. See, but, and it's going to have an effect. It's not going to return unto him void or empty or to be useless. Or my margin says without fruit. The, if his word is going to prosper in the thing where he sends it, then it's going to bear fruit. And that's part of that cycle, like the, the high priest going in like a circuit up and in, into the high, up into the most holy place or into the holy place and down every day. And then once a year into the most holy place, that is a circuit and it's showing forth some. The rain cycle is showing forth some. But again, it's before Pentecost, these things, these are just witnesses. These are examples for our understanding um, and for our learning. And it says, like in Hebrews, um, boy, I'm not even sure where to begin. Uh, well, thanks. So let's go back to the scripture and uh, pick it back up at three again. Uh, Matthew 18, three. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. All right, I'll skip down to 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost. Mm -hmm. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more over that sheep than over the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Right. So he's he's. Picking up that, you know, that he's come to save that which is lost. Not anyone that's, because the whole world is lost, really. But he's going to go after that one that's, you know, that's gone astray. Because that's the one, he's going after his predestinated, again, not that I said, let's go to John 17 and 3. Or John 17. One seventeen. Get up at one. Um, sure. These words spoke Yahshua and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. He's given him power over all flesh, but he's but that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given it. Mm -hmm. 
And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true El, and Yahshua the Messiah, whom thou hast sent. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I have, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. Right, and that was fulfilling the old covenant. That was the work that you gave him to do. As Frank mm -hmm. said, he goes, I, when he came to class, he didn't even know why Yahshua died on the cross. See, he had a work that was, he had to finish, and that was fulfilling that old covenant so he can be in the hearts of mind and men and convert our souls. See, but mm -hmm. it wasn't just any anybody. It was a, a finite amount, Read. And that's what he's talking about here, that there's only, that he doesn't really want the world to be lost, but in the father's purpose, that there's only so many sheep that he gave them. And he's the, he's the shepherd too. And he's, that's why he uses that imagery of the sheep or being like little children or little lambs, like a little, like a lamb is like a, a baby sheep that was just meek and mild and really needs, it needs a savior. It can't fend for itself. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Verse five, and now, O oh Father, glorify thou me in thy own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thy they were, and thou givest them me, and they have kept thy word. Right, and that's what happens to us. That, uh, like the name Yahshua is manifested unto the men and women. You know, he did it to the disciples, but that happens, don't we? That's one of the first things we learn that the name is manifested to us unto the men and women, which he gave, which thou gavest him out of the world. Read. Now that thou have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Mm -hmm. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Right, so he prays for them or those sheep that he had given them, and he prays not for the world, but for them which thou has given me. Because like right. I said, it's a finite amount. I see the five minutes. Let's try to wrap this up. Go ahead. Verse 10, and all are mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. O oh, Holy Father, keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Right. While I, was, while, I, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me I have kept, and none of them is lost for the, but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Right. See, the son of perdition, that's a mystery of iniquity. See, it's right on there. He's lost. He, he kept them in the world. He kept them in his name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And see, none of them is lost. He's right. not losing any of his. Oh, I really wanted to work with like the 10th chapter of John quick um, about laying down his life. And he's the because this talks about going in through the door too, like the, that's that circuit again. You go and think he Yashua calls himself the door and the tabernacle. There's that those doors in the tabernacle that you have to go that that way of going in. There's only one way in. Um, I guess go we'll, we'll end with there, John 10, and we'll see we'll work with that and then I'll be down. Do you want exactly eleven or do you want to start early? Uh just ten and one, I guess. Okay. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Mm -hmm. but, but he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, 
and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Right. And like Marcos was saying, when you hear this, it's like seeing that clear with the eye thing. You know, when you hear his voice, you know, when you see this thing, you know it, you hear it, it's clear. You know, it's not, well, gee, I'm not sure how this works. I'm not saying you got to know everything or everything's not, you know, there's going to be some things that you may not get right away. But, you know, the fact that there's no J, stuff like that, that's pretty crystal clear. That's pretty straightforward. There's no J, no Jesus. It's sometimes that simple. And see, no one, if you walk, if you, you didn't go into the tabernacle, like you didn't go under the, like part of the, you know, the on like the side or you had to go in through the door one was wide because everyone was invited in but narrow is the door to salvation and that other door going into the holy place and if you went into the most holy place well you can ask Aaron or Nadab and Abihu how that worked out for them not very good <laughs> you want to go up in there offer strange incense or not be in there on the day the wrong day because you'll be taken out with meat hooks see but if you go in, the shepherd goes in by the door because he's going in the right way. And that's how he goes. He enters in. When he knocks, we have to answer. And, and if you're his, you will answer because he's not losing any of his. That's the whole point because it's predestination. Uh, let's go, go ahead. Read a little more. Five. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they mm -hmm. know not the voice of strangers. This right. parable spoke Yahshua unto them, but they understood not what things they were, which he spoke unto them. Then said Yahshua unto them again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Right, because they're false prophets, right? I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but to destroy, I'm sorry, the, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Right. And the thief and the robber, that's obviously like the mystery of iniquity. But the good shepherd, he giveth his life for the sheep. And then it goes about the hireling. Read, um, uh, start at 14 and read down to 18. And I'm done. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Mm -hmm. As the father knoweth me, even so know I the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have that are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And right, they shall- Gentiles, he's bringing in the Gentiles, go ahead. And they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Right. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Right. And that's the way Yahshua, he didn't get killed. He sacrificed himself. That's a big difference. He willingly sacrificed. He says, no man took his life. It wasn't Pontius Pilate. It wasn't the Roman soldiers who put him on the cross. He allowed that to happen for the love of his offspring and for his sheep. And that's how we're converted is Yahshua in us is the only, our only hope of glory. <laughs> and with that, I'll see the floor back to the moderator and I'll praise the Yahshua thing. Thank you, Dr. Miller. We'd like to thank everybody who joined us today in our Zoom class. And we'd also like to thank those who will view us on YouTube. We hold our Zoom class every Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time. At this time, we'll be dismissed by the doxology, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.